delight today to be speaking with Dr. Miroslav Wolf and also Matthew Krosman, authors of the text for the life of the world, Theology That Makes a Difference. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Krosman, for joining us today. Good to be with you. Good to be here. Gentlemen, in the first paragraph of the introduction of your book, you state in no uncertain terms that academic theology is in crisis. You write this on page one. Academic theology ought to be, but today largely isn't, about what matters most, the true life in the presence of God. The failure of theology to attend to its purpose is a loss for the church and for the world, for theology is uniquely qualified to explore what matters the most. And this is a loss for theology itself, for theology will either refocus itself on what matters the most or gradually cease to matter at all. What evidences would you point to to indicate this crisis in academic theology? Well, we take a good chunk of the chapter two in order to indicate uh, uh, and note, uh, at least name some of the indicators uh, of the crisis. Um, um, all the way from uh, difficulty um, of graduates of PhD programs to get jobs, uh, to uh, loss of reputation of theology in the scholarly, larger scholarly endeavor, um, and more significantly to certain kind of, um, how shall I put it, uh, Matt, you might want to put it differently, certain kind of acuity in the contemporary way in which, uh, in today's way in which academic theology is being, is being done, so that in some ways, uh, loss of reputation, uh, lack of uh, and loss of audience uh, can be seen as uh, as deserved. Uh, theology deserves as much reputation as it has right now. That's put very strongly. Matt, correct me. No, I I, I think in, in large in large part this is correct. The concern here, this is not a you know make theology great again sort of appeal here. The the concern here is not that sort of theology deserves a place uh, front and center in academia or in, in culture. That it's um, we're not coming here to sort of demand demand our place. Uh, the concern really is here for. Um, for us, for our own field, um, are we producing the sort of work um, that would deserve the sort of scholarly and broader cultural attention? Are we taking up the truly central human question which God has given us in theology? And are we doing, um, are, 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 we, uh, are we doing the sort of work that that question um, uh, uh, deserves? If I may ask, when did you two personally become aware of this crisis in theology? Um, I, I think it crystallized itself for myself. Um, after I read a book by a colleague of ours here at Yale from the law school, who's also a philosopher and teaches in humanities um, in uh, what's uh, Yale's uh, kind of great books program. Uh, it's a book, uh, it's called The Education Send. And basically the thesis of that, uh, that book is expressed in the subtitle uh, of the book that uh, our great universities and colleges have given up on what used to be at the very heart of their endeavor. Uh, and as I was reading this book, uh, Antoni was writing this about uh, humanities and universities in general, and uh, uh, I realized, you know what, this is exactly what's happening also in, uh, in theology. And uh, maybe other disciplines can uh, be sustained without uh, taking up this fundamental question, but theology is about to lose its soul uh, when it loses this central question. Um, the question of what matters the most, what is the meaning of, of our life, and of course for theology that's always, always reference to, uh, to the re revelation of God in Christ and ultimately to relationship to God. I, I think for I think for me, um, uh, sort of, one can I can look back and see early indicators. Um, at the beginning of my PhD program, um, I was told, um, I was sort of being given a rundown of what to expect in this New Testament PhD program I was in, um, and the thought the outline was sort of given flippantly to uh, described as well. First, there's a couple of years of coursework, and then in the third year, there are exams and the preparation of the uh, of the proposal for the dissertation. And usually, somewhere in there as well, there's usually a divorce. Um, and and this was just described uh, sort of sort of flippantly, and it, it understood that it was a sort of uh, gallows humor. 
Um, but but that sort of, I mean, it's one of the things we take up in the book, that sort of divorce of, of uh, theological work and theological life um, is really, really troubling to me. Um, and, uh, and, and I, uh, I, I care about the people in this field um, as, at least as much as I care about the work that we're doing. Um, and, and I think we're, uh, one of the things we're calling for, right, is, a, uh, is theological life that goes along with theological work. Um, and to the extent to which we've given up on that possibility or even expected the opposite, uh, that, that's really troubling. Hmm. It's our delight today to be speaking with Dr. Miroslav Wolf and Matthew Crosman, authors of For the Life of the World, Theology That Makes a Difference. Gentlemen, if I can read just a opening line that you have on page 36 of your text. Um, you write, when two or more young theologians are gathered these days, they are just as likely to talk about job scarcity and inadequate compensation as about God. God's relation to the world or the world's relation to God. Many folks working through this program or future graduate students don't yet uh, appreciate the crisis the way you two would working on the inside of academic theology. What is driving this large scale change in our academies? Well, I mean, one, one simple thing um, on that particular comment is uh, humanities broadly are really, um, are, are really struggling. The, the, I'll speak here as a young academic. Um, uh, jobs are hard to come by for, for young folks working in, in the humanities. Um, and that's uh, unsurprisingly something that's also experienced um, by young theologians. And again, we describe this in the second chapter of the book, a lot of the dynamics that make this particularly, if it's hard for uh, folks working in the humanities in general, it's particularly difficult for those um, uh, working in theology. Uh, the, 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 the job market, the job market is rough. The, the other thing, of course, that's happening there, and we're, again, always pointing the finger back at ourselves. Um, and again, I'll speak here as a, as a, as a young scholar. Uh, the concern here uh, is, of course, not just that, oh, well, there's a tough job market, so we're all going to complain about it. Um, but uh, but there's, there's a tough job market, and there's a formation process within the guild um, that has itself cast a vision of what flourishing life looks like that is relatively a relatively narrow picture of professional success um, of you know the, the life of a uh, an R1 scholar and if uh, that sort of life is hard to find um, again there aren't those sorts of resources of what I would hope would come from a sort of theologically lived life that would have a broader vision of what um, a good life, even a successful life um, of, a, of a theologian lived for the sake of the church, lived life lived for the sake of the world, um, perhaps outside the, the walls of, of, of academia. But I, it's this combination of this sort of dire circumstance within academia, and I think a loss of vision for uh, a broader vocation, a broader calling um, beyond just the replication of, of the sort of um, specialized uh, knowledge production within the theological guild. I mean, just, just to add a little bit to what Matt said for, from my own perspective, uh, for me at the heart of it is in a sense uh, what Matt just uh, finished with, which is kind of a sense of loss of a true vocation uh, and the passion for the kind of uh, kind of work uh, that theology uh, that theological work is. I mean, I, I think if if you count the students of theology as theologians, and I know that there are theologians who count themselves as students of theology and would never describe themselves as theologians, and both of these are are true. Schleiermacher and, and never signed himself as a theologian, but as a student of theology, right? But it's also true that, that aspiring as students of theology are always already theologians. And if you count this, uh, then, then, then I've been a theologian for some uh, 45 uh, years or so. And I can say I haven't regretted a single day of being uh, a theologian. And I've always experienced it as a, 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 as a, as a calling above all with all the difficulties that that uh, entail, uh, including for me working in an environment which I had to fundraise in order to pay, have my, my salary uh, paid when I was uh, working in former Yugoslavia. But it was, it was a passion, it was a calling. And I think for theology, that's really, uh, really fundamental because it is uh, not about um, our intellectual explanations uh, of theological dimensions of, of reality, but it's about God's calling 
to make this world into the home of God uh, to, for us to achieve however construed our final end. And I would want us as theologians to continue having this passion uh, for theology, which is a passion for God's reign, which is a passion uh, for God. And Maltman uh, said, I don't know whether we quote that in the book, and said, we are theologians for the sake of God. God is our passion, and God is our agony as well. So something of that sort uh, is what I'm, uh, what I'm hoping for. You describe the book as a manifesto. This is a, a, a robust call to action. And uh, you identify human flourishing as the key to theology's revitalization. Human flourishing, Dr. Wolf, is a concept that you have worked with extensively. I'm thinking of your 2015 book titled Flourishing, Why We Need Religion in a Globalized World. Would you, Professor Wolf, be, be willing to define for us what is it that you're speaking of when you're speaking of this concept of human flourishing? You know, we can use a, a multiplicity of terms to express what uh, flourishing from one angle uh, expresses. Uh, and I would say that in the, in the New Testament, it comes under the rubric uh, of the true life. It comes under the rubric kingdom of God, uh, reign of God. It comes under the rubric later in the church tradition, building on the Greek uh, philosophical tradition, uh, under the rubric of the good life. Uh, we can name, use various names to describe this, but it is the kind of vision that of uh, human fullness, um, uh, which is God, our God's calling upon our lives and God's um, plan, uh, God's goal for the history uh, as a whole. So ultimately flourishing for me means um, coming of God to the world to make out of the world, the entire world, the home uh, of God, when every creature and every human being flourishes and flourishes together in the presence uh, of God. Now, we parse that out in the book, uh, and especially last chapter it tries to illustrate how one might do that by looking at uh, the writings of Apostle Paul, uh, and we have our formal definition also of, of flourishing that is then filled out with content. That formal definition of flourishing um, applies to other traditions as well, but specifically um, has deeply Christian content then as well. Dr. Krosman, if I can address this question to you, where is it that you see the most hope for the future of the study of theology and formation of young theologians? I think that increasingly um, theology is being uh, drawn back to the church. Um, in part, we see this um, when uh, in in the in the ways that uh, uh, church uh, church training programs um, are are filling in gaps for for people who can't go or um, haven't had the opportunity to go to seminary. Um, we think about our our colleagues in the UK at St. Melitus College who are um, who are where, where theology is really, um, I think, really flourishing um, in the context of, uh, of of the renewal of the church. And so um, academic theology and sort of church theology, I think, are coming closer together in various sorts of places. Um, not that that is, a, that is always a silver bullet and that that, 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 that always works, but I think that because um, there, there are, of course, um, uh, there are church theologies that um, uh, that, that have lost their way uh, alongside academic theologies that have lost their way. But I think that the extent to which um, the concerns of the, of the church, the concerns of the people of God um, come back to the center of, of theological uh, concern. And that's, of course, uh, for us, uh, never separated from uh, taking the concerns of just the fundamental human concerns back to the heart of theology. Um, I think uh, I think theology will, will be enriched. Um, the church is, I think, uh, Christian theology's first interface with those human concerns, um, and I think there's I think there's a lot uh, a lot to find hope in in the way that theology is being drawn back into the heart of the church, and that the church, um, I think, is the is the fertile is the is the fertile ground um, in which uh, uh, theology really can flourish. Hmm. Dr. Volf, may I address that question also to you? Where is it, sir, from your perspective that you see the greatest hope for the future of the study of theology? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with, uh, with, uh, with Matt. I, I think that uh, the interest in theology, um, which is to say interest in, um, 
kind of the thinking side of the practice of faith, which is, I think, what theology uh, is, uh, comes properly out of the practice of that faith itself. And the place where that faith is practiced uh, are the communities uh, of faith. So I think the hope for me comes, uh, comes, uh, comes from there. I think it presupposes a certain kind of uh, renewal, uh, renewal of the church, vibrancy of, of the church, presupposes also that church is about what matters the most, rather than the church itself ha has gone the way in which, in a sense, theology has gone, and we note uh, some of the tendencies in that direction uh, as well. And so I suppose I would say, uh, without one, without um, kind of wanting to sound, sound pious, I, I would say the hope of theology is in God. The hope of theology is the spirit of God that vivifies uh, our own lives. It's the uh, capturing of this vision which, about which Christ's life was, life was all about. And once that vision is, is captured, uh, kind of intellectual attention to that vision, hopefully we, uh, will, will follow. That's how theology developed. And I, I want to always uh, remind, uh, remind myself that actually, uh, you know, that the heart of theology is a baptismal, baptismal formula, heart of confessions, which is the heart of theology, is baptismal formula. Baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who's the Father? Who's the Son? Who's the Holy Spirit? What is it the life? Uh, what is that life into which we have been inducted by the act of baptism? Once that's taken very seriously, I think theology will, will follow. And I think it will follow the course, just the kind of course that we are sketching for it in this book. In this text, For the Life of the World, Theology That Makes a Difference, uh, you work through the theory of this change in academic theology and the necessity for the, the re-engagement with these fundamental questions that are part of uh, theology's history, but, but you don't speak directly to the practitioner. You don't speak directly to the guy who's going to start a church training institute and, and, and go with this. Would you take a moment and address that person uh, for us here? What are some of the advantages that that practitioner should be alert to as they anticipate uh, um, engaging those fundamental questions of theology within a, a church training program as an example? And what are some cautions that you would also give to that person? Oh, what a wonderful question. Uh, and, and a difficult question uh, for, for it's a, a kind of a question partly beyond my pay grade. If I were a dean, uh, say, of the theological faculty, uh, that's what I'd have to think about it. If I were a, a, a theological entrepreneur um, of the type that you're describing in the churches, that's exactly what I would have to think, think about. And of course, it is, it is uh, our constant concern. And now as you speak about it, I, I think, oh, that will be, that, it, it'll be great actually to be able to sit with a, uh, with, with a group of um, people dedicated to church education, with a group of folks who are dead, uh, theological education in the church, with a group of folks who are deans of theological seminaries or even of uh, chairs of Christianly inflected religious studies department, and try to think what kind of agenda would have to be set for the transformation of the theological educational programs that, uh, that are already underway and how might the new ones uh, be best, best organized. I think one thing I, I'd, I'd say is that I would want to make sure that theology doesn't splinter into to multiplicity of uh, sub-disciplines. I, I understand specialization, but I think theology at the same time uh, lives out of addressing the whole of the Christian life and thematizing the whole of it. And so uh, a certain kind of amateurishness uh, is uh, required of all uh, theologians, almost like being a dilettante is 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 a condition of possibility specialized in specialist in one area and dilettante in all, all others as a condition of possibility of theology and you may know that Karl Rahner uh, ends his uh, foundations of Christian faith with a famous praise of this just this kind of dilettantism and that's the guy who was one of the most erudite of theologians uh, who have uh, written in 20th uh, century 
I think the other thing that uh, I, I absolutely agree with, the, especially the, the integration of the, of the sub-disciplines, I think often we sort of think about, uh, in academic theology, we think about theology as you know, a collection of five or six almost unrelated um, um, guilds that each have their own specialization. I'm trained as a New Testament scholar. Uh, there can even be uh, little, uh, uh, you know, struggles of, of, of pride, <laughs> competition between the sort of uh, guilds. But, but more importantly, they, they seem to each have a very different sort of, um, there's a different sort of intellectual formation offered in each one of these guilds. Um, uh, in very different sorts of directions in terms of uh, hi historical um, historical uh, sort of uh, questions alone, um, anthropological questions sometimes uh, alone, uh, uh, you know, ethical uh, puzzle solving uh, on its own, uh, uh, sort of a particular sort of systematic theological uh, questions uh, that maybe feel like they're stuck within a sort of uh, a set outline and we're just trying to uh, des describe each question sort of as, as they come to us. Anyway, these different sorts of disciplinary um, orientations, I think, uh, need to find integration. And especially as you, I think it's one of the fruitful things about reconceiving of theology in the context of, as you said, a, a sort of church training program is that uh, the church, the practical life of ministry, the life of and indeed the life of faith uh, won't allow us to sort of uh, divide our, our reflection and our practice quite so profoundly. Of course, we'll slide into different modes and avail ourselves of different sorts of disciplinary thinking, um, but, but really quickly, it's gonna need to be, be integrated. The, the thing I'd wanna add is, um, I, I think also what you would see in those sorts of environments is you need to figure out some sort of way in which um, the cultivation of certain sorts of mental uh, certain sorts of intellectual practices and um, and sort of induction into uh, these sorts of scholarly uh, guilds and scholarly discourses would need to be paired with personal formation um, and the sort of formation of the of of the of the whole person. And I think that comes um, uh, in in part we see in the classroom that comes by setting sort of existential stakes for theology, right? Where um, theology for me is most alive uh, when it's not just something I'm, I'm studying about what, what this person over there has thought or what this person over here has thought, um, but the questions are being posed to me in the second person. What do, uh, as Jesus turns to the disciples and, and says, after he asks, you know, what do, who do people say that I am? That's a good, important question to, to ask and, and get a handle on. But more importantly, he then follows up and says, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? And I think when we can get that sort of those personal existential stakes um, at, at the heart of our of our theological inquiry, um, that's when it really starts to get um, some traction in our lives. And that will necessarily then um, mean that our theological inquiries uh, can never be divorced from our own processes of personal formation, our own processes of discipleship, our own processes of, of, of allowing the Holy Spirit to renew us and, and form uh, in us uh, the likeness of Christ. You know, we should add as a, as a footnote that uh, one of the go one of the, our aspirations was to include a chapter on education, on theological education in this book, uh, and we gesture toward it in in the in the introduction. But in the end, it it's proven to be too difficult to write just a chapter. It deserves a kind of a self-standing book that would take up the vision and then ask, well, what is the pedagog, uh, how, how do we operationalize that in pedagogical kinds of way, all the way from building institutions to what happens to, in the classroom and even outside of it. Gentlemen, if, if I could close with one question uh, that we have been asking all of our interviewees on this program, and that is this, how can Christians today pursue the unity that Jesus prays for in John 17. And one of the one of the things we take up in this in this book is that um, this question of flourishing life, the the nature of flourishing life, the shape of the good life. This is a fundamentally human question. Um, so in that sense, it is a uniting question. Um, if we share this quest, um, then we have, I think something like the sort of friendship that C.S. Lewis points us to. He says that those who share our answers may be our companions along the way, but those who share our questions, who think that some question, little regarded by others, is of great importance, these people will be our friends. Um, and and we, we conceive of this in, in the book in, as a sort of framework for a, a grand human project, um, understanding uh, human uh, sociality, human culture uh, writ large as a sort of 
uh, contestation over the truth of the question of the good life. Um, but also, of course, the church uh, is, is, is itself um, a sort of, we describe Christianity as a, uh, a quarrelsome family of, of, of visions of the good life. Um, as Christians, we don't all have exactly the same uh, sort of uh, answers or the same sort of way of understanding uh, the, the, the good life in light of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. But if we have this question in mind, and if even more so, um, we ask this question precisely in light of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ, um, that quest, that pursuit itself, I think, can be um, a, a, a truly, um, a truly unifying, uh, a sort of crucial, sort of common ground and common pursuit for us to share together as Christians. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, only to echo some of the comments that uh, that Matt uh, Matt made. Uh, one God for the whole world, one triune God for the whole world, one triune God revealed in Jesus Christ for the whole world. That is, uh, according to certainly John um, 17, uh, the foundation of the unity of the church, but fund potentially foundation of unity of all, because Jesus prays there for all who will believe uh, later on. And uh, that prayer is, uh, I, I think, a good uh, high priestly prayer in John 17 is, is a good charter of, um, of unity of the church. Uh, and that unity is found in the unity with Christ and unity of Christ with the triune, uh, triune God. Um, I, I think um, um, the ends of God with the world are one world, uh, but one world that is differentiated in multiplicity of different cultures, and one world that speaks, uh, as we see in um, uh, Acts, to many languages. And so if we can keep the unity uh, centered into oneness, uh, while allowing both individuality and speaking of culturally different languages, will have kind of unity and diversity, for which I think Christ prayed there in um, John 17. Dr. Wolf, Dr. Krosman, thank you so much for your time today and for discussing your book with us. Thank you for having us. Good to be with you.